everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our second in our three part housing series with the South Shore Chamber. I'm going to give everyone just a couple minutes to load up on the screen. So um, just bear with us for a moment. All right. All right. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again. I'm going to go ahead and make some general announcements here uh, about our session today. Um, we are going to be recording. And uh, it is recording now. So just keep that in mind. Um, we are very excited to have um, some really wonderful experts with us today. Um, my name is Courtney Biergaard. I am the housing lead at the South Shore Chamber of Commerce. Um, we, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, we are a, a regional chamber. We uh, have a large economic regional development plan called South Shore 2030. I encourage you to um, take a look at our uh, website www.southshore2030.com. Um, we would not be able to do any of this work without our housing initiative funders, uh, Rockland Trust, Cape Cod Lumber, Fire King, uh, Mass Housing Partnership, and Sullivan Tire. So I just want to give a huge thank you to them. Uh, we are in our third year now and um, really starting to see some, some great inroads with um, our local communities and, and looking at housing as an economic development tool. Um, it's really important for us as a business organization uh, and, and a community organization to think um, about how housing and transportation are economic development tools for our region and how they shape things like placemaking in our region and help us to grow our economy. So that's why you're here today. We're super excited for this conversation. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much more about us. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Nancy Bailey who is the co-chair of the Chambers Housing Committee uh, and uh, lead of commercial lending for Rockland Trust. We're super excited to have her here to help um, introduce the session. And uh, Nancy, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Thank you very much, Courtney. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the second session of our three part series on housing. My name is Nancy Bailey. And as Courtney mentioned, I am um, I'm not in charge of commercial lending. I am a team leader in the commercial division here at Rockland Trust. I've also lived on the South Shore for my entire life. At Rockland Trust, we're very interested and we're very invested in the success of the Chambers Housing Initiative and the South Shore 2030 plan. Not just because we finance projects, but more importantly, because we know in order to have a strong regional economy, we have to address the housing challenges in the region. It's a critical issue for our businesses, sustainability, because it greatly impacts the capability of our company to recruit and retain our most important assets our talent. As the co-chair of the housing committee, I wanted to share a few quick updates. Rockland Trust has been involved since the beginning. Here we are three years in and we're really starting to see some great progress. We've seen some local zoning changes resulting in more homes, more collaboration across communities, and more engagement from the business community in the economic development work. The housing initiative has been a catalyst to take on additional strategies laid out in the South Shore 2030 plan. This year, the Chamber launched its Transportation Advisory Group and a Water and Sewer Site Readiness Study in partnership with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. If you want to learn more about either of these initiatives or any of the work in the 2030 plan, reach out to Courtney, Peter, or anyone on the staff. With that update, let's go ahead and get started on the program today. We are very happy to have with us some amazing ex experts in the housing and transportation space. I'd like to start by introducing Janice Bergeron, Vice Chair of the Chamber's Transportation Advisory Group. She will be introducing our speakers and serving as the moderator for the Q&A portion of the program. Janice is the President and CEO of RMD Consultants, a firm specializing in comprehensive consulting services on the transportation, infrastructure, real estate development, and construction. 
Janice has worked in the engineering and construction industry for 25 years with a focus in complex transportation and development projects. We're thrilled to have her as your expertise today. Janice, you're up. Thank you, Nancy. So great to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to go ahead and get things started. As Nancy, Nancy mentioned, I'm the Vice Chair of the Chambers Transportation Advisory Group, and we're going to be holding a forum and very shortly and um, really focus on the T's recent announcements. So while it's at the top of everybody's mind um, about some of the issues that the MBTA is having, we're gonna keep this conversation focused on the connection between housing and transportation in the relationship that they play in that connection between housing and placemaking strategies. We'll hear from both of our presenters and then have a question and a session. Please use the Q&A and chat functions to submit a question and comment and we'll do our best to get through them during the session. If we don't get to all of them, we'll try to follow up with you later on some thoughts. And as a reminder, we'll share the presentation but via email through the fall after the session. So with that, I'd love to introduce to you Dr. Tracy Corley. She is a TOD Development Fellow at Mass Inc. Dr. Corley brings expertise in economic development, business, labor markets, architecture, law, and public policy to Mass Inc. She spent time in many cities across the globe and is passionate about creating economic development activities and sustainable livelihoods. For people in our world's metropolitan regions, Dr. Cor Dr. Corley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Janice. I really appreciate that. And so I'm going to share my screen. If I can find where the, uh, I apologize, I have to maximize. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for that gracious introduction. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit uh, more today um, about, broadly about housing and how it fits into an overall uh, economic development strategy. You know, as a former architect, small business owner, and a vice chair of small business for the Greater Seattle Chamber Board, I understand some of the challenges that uh, the South Shore Chamber of Commerce is uh, attempting to kind of tackle uh, with this three-part series. And so I hope that today's uh, conversation will be informative as, as to how to kind of tie all of these components together. Of course, as the TOD fellow at Mass Inc, uh, the focus of our strategy is on transit-oriented development. And um, exactly why are we looking at uh, transit-oriented development? and uh, how to uh, transform uh, regions uh, using uh, transit-oriented development. And let's see. So why transformative TOD? I have to first I want to start the conversation by sharing this uh, uh, tweet. Uh, somewhere uh, near you right now, a human is walking indoors on a treadmill for like 45 minutes before they drive a mile to buy a coffee. We know how um, impactful uh, tra traffic can be on communities and how mobility ties uh, very strongly into uh, people's uh, ability to uh, foster economic development in our regions. Um, and part of that is uh, not just uh, housing and it's not just transportation, uh, but it's actually a combination of all of these things. Because in order to uh, transform a region, you have to have all of these things working together. So um, what this means is creating places where people have what they need within a 15 minute uh, walk, bike ride or drive of where they live. So long commutes across uh, regions in order to do things like get basic groceries uh, don't work uh, for creating um, uh, places that uh, people wanna invest in and what places where people wanna live and what places that uh, businesses want to relocate to. Uh, why is this important? Um, I put up here the 29% premium. Um, creating walkable, livable places where people have easy access to basic services with an easy reach of where they live, um, as uh, just you know, from a pure pers economic perspective, adds a 29% premium to land values. I mean, that's a very strong economic reason for doing walkability. 
uh, but also for making sure that people have access to uh, the, all the amenities uh, that they need within that walkable area. Uh, but then whenever you add transit-oriented development to that, you add an additional premium to that because people have alternatives for getting around their communities. So think about the consequences of not doing an integrated strategy that makes places walkable, that brings together activities that allow people to live, work, learn, and play right in their own communities, and not providing um, alternatives for ways for people to get around. You know, this is a challenge that we're seeing right now with the pandemic, with parents who can't find quiet places to work while they're uh, doing homeschooling. Uh, we're seeing that you know, retirees and people who are trapped at home right now can't find easy ways to get to the grocery store, especially if they don't have access to a car. Um, we also know that, you know, key staff members right now, they, they're having a difficult time reaching the office if uh, transit service is shut down or um, they don't have a reliable access to, uh, to a car. So we want to make sure that we uh, position the South Shore as a desirable region uh, for workers and entrepreneurs who can help fuel local growth and innovation. And so making places walkable and making places uh, very accessible to transit and uh, transportation alternatives uh, is the strategy that is a way to make that happen. And so I just wanna provide a little information about what's going on. Uh, this is a, a, a chart that comes from um, uh, the math from Mascot, kind of showing that ever since the pandemic, people have been walking more. And that even includes right there uh, in, in South Shore. There are very few communities in uh, the Massachusetts that are uh, walking less. And so people are walking more and uh, people are staying closer to home. Um, I've heard uh, that people uh, are, are sensing that, you know, traffic is getting much worse in local communities. Um, but as you can see here, I've included just a few of the counties in Massachusetts on this chart um, with uh, Norfolk and Plymouth counties in the red and the pink lines. You can see that, you know, immediately after the pandemic started, we had a huge plummet in the number of uh, miles that people were driving, uh, but then that slowly started to tick back up. And we see in some areas uh, that it's gotten close to uh, pre-pandemic uh, driving levels. Uh, but, you know, people are still traveling uh, the, uh, roughly, they're getting closer to traveling the same amount of distance that they did before, uh, but they're doing it less to commute long distances like into downtown Boston than they are to uh, using that to actually travel around their local communities. And so at MassSync, we talk about there's three uh, pillars of uh, transformative transit-oriented development. Uh, we think about these as three pillars because all three of these are required in order to create a place that has access to all of those uh, pieces that actually make for a region that's desirable for pe people to both move to, as well as for businesses to invest in and move to. And we call those uh, integrative land use, equitable transportation, and inclusive economic development. All of these uh, uh, components that you see here at the bottom of the slide are different pieces that kind of make up these three pillars. Uh, some of the pieces like housing are very, um, uh, sometimes land very squarely into integrative land use. Uh, but then again, housing is also an economic development tool. Uh, ways in which uh, you attract investment in the development of housing and help to activate local uh, residents for developing housing in their own communities. That can be a very strong economic development tool. So all of the different ways in which uh, you can think about building the three pillars of transformative TOD, um, all of those ways uh, actually play multiple roles in uh, helping to shape a community or region. And so what the data is kind of showing us, I'm not gonna present anything you guys don't already know about what's happening in Plymouth and Norfolk County, um, especially for those uh, communities in those two counties that are served by the chamber. Um, you have you know, relatively um, high, moderate to high uh, medium ho median household income, um, kind of moderate age of uh, population, you know, relatively high uh, education levels, um, and uh, relatively high rates of home ownership. We also see on this, uh, in, on this slide that when it comes to mobility, however, that a couple of communities are very walkable and actually have very good infrastructure or have decent infrastructure for walking, for walking and transit. Uh, but for the most part uh, across the South Shore, it is a very car dependent uh, region of the state. So when we talk about what we can do to think about how housing uh, kind of, um, uh, how 
housing and ways in which we can use housing as an economic development tool focus more on linking centers of capacity and activity. And this starts by kind of asking, you know, where in the region are there areas of high activity? Also, where are there areas for potential development? And this includes productive and un uh, unproductive uh, land uses, unprotective uses, brown fields and adaptive reuse. Uh, the difference between productive and, and protective uses, productive uses are those that uh, either provide housing or uh, business locations, uh, things that can actually be used for either building um, economic or social capital within the community. Um, but un a protective uh, uses are those places that do things like uh, marshes that allow for um, uh, 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 absorbing water to prevent uh, area flooding or and sewer overflows. So you have some areas that uh, should be pr uh, protected in your communities in order to kind of help make sure that uh, the, your investments in your more productive spaces are actually protected. Uh, areas for adaptive reuse. You also want to look at uh, whether, you know, where are their local clusters and ecosystems. And this re refers specifically to economic development of where are there areas where industries have clustered together to create a kind of uh, a related community of businesses uh, that um, help to form an industry for investment and development in the region. And where do you have small business ecosystems? And the difference between clusters and ecosystems is that small business ecosystems don't necessarily have to be in similar industries or even related. Even if you are not uh, in retail or in education or in child care, those types of businesses are supportive businesses which help a lot of industries run and function as I think a lot of people with children are finding out right now as they're enduring uh, the lockdown with the pandemic. And also, as you're looking at around uh, your areas, think about areas where there might be disconnects in transportation or other infrastructure. And so I actually took some time to take a look around the South Shore to kind of identify in the top 10, uh, uh, the larger, the 10 communities with the largest population, where are uh, potential areas for capacity and activity? And keep in mind, as someone who spent only a little bit of time in the South Shore, particularly in Quincy and Braintree, that uh, I am not intimately familiar with your communities, uh, but this is an outsider perspective of just doing a quick you know, search, uh, some uh, uh, spatial analysis to identify where might there be places to link. And we like to say that trans-oriented development is not about building housing next to train stations. It's really about creating mixed use development and uh, communities where people can get to a variety of activities uh, within 15 minutes. And so I kind of like just doing this initial analysis kind of identified a couple of points that seem to be uh, relevant in each of these communities. And as I kind of zoned in here, you see that some of them like uh, Jonathan's Landing and Tedeschi Plaza actually fall with them, uh, along commuter rail lines, but other places like um, the internet, uh, the, the South, um, uh, Massachusetts 18 in South Weymouth or um, the Braintree Hill Office Park aren't necessarily on the commuter rail line. And so um, we're not quite sure exactly how uh, well those areas are connected. So these are the nodes of activity at some nodes like the ones along uh, MA18 and MA53 kind of make up quarters of activity. Identifying those is, is gonna be really critical and really important to thinking about how transit oriented development uh, can play a role in developing housing and economy uh, and the economy of the South Shore region. So we talked, uh, I wanna talk just briefly about MBTA cuts and what potential that could have on um, the region. Um, transit, housing and economic development are core to the three uh, pillars, uh, not just for TOD, but also for regional development. It's really important to kind of think of all of these things as working together because as soon as you take out one piece or one piece is underdeveloped, underdeveloped the entire strategic plan collapses. Um, so cuts uh, will impact development by uh, reducing um, uh, confidence in the ability to kind of get around uh, and which help which hurts both people who want to live there as well as uh, businesses who want to locate there. Um, and making sure that uh, people can get around, not just as young workers, but people who can get around throughout the life cycles. You know, it's, are these um, areas, um, uh, does the uh, transportation and transit, does it allow for people, you know, young children or people with disabilities or older populations or people who can't drive or much less don't have a car, does, does it allow for uh, people of all abilities and mobilities? And so, 
the, you know, MBTA and as well as regional transit authority cuts uh, will stymie development if not properly um, uh, reinvested in. Uh, so this is something that um, need to make sure to kind of keep an eye on. Um, and keeping in mind that right now with the pandemic, there's a lot of concern about riding transit because of the pandemic, but we have multiple research studies that show that it's crowding, not transit itself, that actually causes problems. And whenever you actually make cuts, you actually increase the amount of crowding that actually exists on transit. So final mile solutions, well, if you don't focus on final mile solutions, you are gonna be stifling development by turning those productive and protective land uses into non-productive, non-protective uses. Like I say, you know, want to make sure that you're protecting uh, as well as uh, thinking about areas to invest in for more production. Fortunately, the MBTA as well as BAT are starting to uh, ramp up a little bit more on t in terms of service. I know with the commuter rail service, people are concerned about uh, the cuts to, um, uh, to rush hour uh, and peak time, travel times. Uh, but one of the strategies that I know that the MBTA is working on is uh, kind of spreading um, service out throughout the day because we know that 15% of the reasons why people travel is for uh, commutes to work. The other 85% of the reasons why people travel is for everything else. And so to actually shape your uh, development strategy only on commutes, especially around transportation, will uh, not get you to where you need to be in order to have a truly sustainable uh, regional development strategy. So the bottom line is that transit-oriented development can help attract residents and businesses to the South Shore. Um, by you thinking about transit-oriented development as um, a, a key strategy, um, you can actually use that to transform the region to create a virtuous cycle of investment, economic stability, and uh, sustainable growth that whenever you only focus on a parcel by parcel or deal by deal, uh, basis, um, you're not going to get. Um, one of the things I would just want to emphasize, and we can talk about more in the discussion, is that equity is central to transformative TOD, and gateway cities like Quincy play an important role as regional hubs to reducing uh, geographic and social, socioeconomic inequalities, as well as for uh, overall development, but they can't do it alone. It has to be a regional effort, and I'm glad that the South Shore Chamber of Commerce is kind of leading that effort. So I'm going to just leave you with my final slide, which is a South Shore Transformation TOD Action Plan of kind of charging uh, the partners who are on the call today to start with identifying centers of activity uh, that includes both nodes and corridors, um, and then also inventory areas for potential development. From there, you can then focus on final mile solutions with connections to those centers of capacity and activity and then uh, use that to advance a dual strategy of cluster and ecosystem economic development for small businesses as well as larger and uh, medium-sized businesses. Also, uh, make housing central to real estate development, but housing is gonna be absolutely useless unless people have activities to do in their local communities. So make housing a part of a mixed use, walkable district development with re reliable shuttles, bikes, and pedestrian infrastructure. Thanks, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Janice. Thank you, Dr. Corley. Your presentation was fantastic and um, very informative, as always. So with that, I want to um, introduce our next speaker, Callie Clark. Callie is the Director of Policy for the Center of Housing Data at Massachusetts Housing Partnership. MHP created the Center for Housing Data in 2017 to promote effective housing policies. Examples of its research include Datatown and Todex, which we'll hear more about in Callie's presentation today. The center provides access to demographic, transit, and housing data to improve state policy foster effective community conversations and ensure that we meet our housing needs throughout Massachusetts. Kelly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Janice. <clears throat> I'm just gonna share my screen and then we'll jump into the presentation. So um, as Janice said, my name is Callie Clark. I'm here from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, and I'm here today to talk about a website that we created at the end of last year called TODEX, which stands for Transit-Oriented Development Explorer. 
Um, Tracy did a great job of setting up um, what's currently happening in around TOD and what are some future questions we should be asking. And I have a little bit of additional data behind that to kind of set the context for what's happening here on the South Shore. Um, so as you said, just a little bit of background. I'm from the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. We're a quasi-public agency created in 1985. Um, our goals are to increase the supply of affordable housing in the state and work with municipalities to demonstrate new and better ways of meeting our affordable housing needs. Um, we do this in four different ways through work of our community assistance team. I think my colleague Katie Lacey might be joining us today. Um, through permanent financing for affordable rental housing, through our one mortgage program for first time home buyers, and research on housing data to support policy efforts, which is why I'm here with you today. Um, so a little bit about the website that I'm going to show you today. Um, the website was created in order to have more conversations about land use that focus on the interconnectedness of housing, transportation, and climate. Um, the TODEX website is our first step in doing this with future research focusing on the nexus of these crucial priorities. Um, again, Dr. Corley walked through this, but why prioritize TOD? Why are we as a housing organization focused on transit-oriented development? Well, there are a variety of reasons why we think it's so important. Um, reduce car dependence, successful transit systems that rely on concentrated development patterns. Um, oftentimes our current land use patterns are just not environmentally sustainable. Thinking about quality of life in the Commonwealth with better access to jobs, recreation, and services. Um, we are at MHP really focused on affordable housing near public transportation to provide mobility and access for those who need it the most. Um, as many of you know, I'm sure, um, before COVID, uh, tough commutes take away from economic activity, impact public and mental health, and then infrastructure and efficiency from concentrated development. Um, so a little bit of background about the website and the methodology before I jump right into it. So um, the way that we created this website is we um, use three different sources, tax assessors data, um, master address data, and also a proprietary database called CoStar. So what we're really looking to do is around every single station area in the MBTA system in the Commonwealth, what is the residential density around each of those stations? Again, to kind of set a line in the sand of where are we as of this time? Um, and we're hoping in um, years to come, we can reflect back on where we've been and see the progress that we've made. Um, so the most important thing was calculating these station areas and their residential density. Um, so what we did is we created station areas in uh, GIS or geographic information systems. We created a half mile buffer around each of these stations as the crow flies. So this does not take into account walkability. Um, then use buffers where, we, where they overlapped in order. We use DCM polygons to make equidistant divisions between stations. So this is basically if there was a um, large concentration of stations, mostly um, on the, um, the red line, for example, we were able to separate out different stations. And um, we also omitted protected green space and um, from the station area land calculation, so we weren't holding, uh, using that against people. Um, and from there, we created residential density metrics. So we took the total residential unit count as of the most complete data that we had available. And again, this was released in December of 2019, and then divided it by the total acres in this newly created station area that we had calculated. Um, and so here are some of our findings. Um, uh, I looked at um, the station areas within the South Shore um, Chamber catchment area um, and found that you have 30 station areas on the South Shore. Um, it's an overall pretty low density of 3.2 homes per acre in these station areas. Um, for context, um, the entire system, I believe the average is 6.2 um, homes per acre, so about half of that. Um, of the 30 stations on the South Shore, 23 had a gross density level of less than five units per acre. Um, and one metric that we use, you know, um, some of these is, is that good? Is that bad? What does that mean? 
Um, so when looking at the entire Commonwealth, um, we said, well, as a thought experiment, what if the, um, you know, I said it was 6.2 units per acre was the average across the Commonwealth. And we said, well, what if we shot a little bit higher and thought about um, an average of 10 homes per acre for every station area in the system or across the system? Um, so that's kind of our the goal that we set um, as a thought experiment. If we did this on the South Shore um, with these 30 stations, that would account, that would um, add up to almost 75,000 more housing units on the South Shore. Again, with that high metric of um, 10 units per acre across the South Shore system. If we have that, which might be more appropriate for this region, and thought about an average of five homes per acre, we would still be adding over 20,000 more housing units on the South Shore. Um, and again, I'm gonna walk you through some examples so you can see what does around 10 units per acre look like compared to what does five units per acre look like. And just another thing that um, the data collection told us is there's a huge variation in development patterns as a result of um, inconsistent expectations around TOD values across municipalities. So as we all know in Massachusetts, um, land use is a local decision um, and using this TODEX website, you can see the, the different decisions made at different points uh, around transit-oriented development. So with that, I'm gonna walk us through a few examples that I thought were um, interesting to look at for your region. I'm gonna start with um, denser stations and then um, end with the, the least dense station in the system, which I believe is the Kingston station. Um, and we'll have plenty of time for questions after this so we can kind of dig into the data if people are interested in that. Um, so this is Quincy Station. Um, as you can see, um, it's on the red line, also um, serves commuter rail. Um, it notes what communities are served, again, by this um, created station area that we created. It tells you the total number of residential units um, so anything that is not colored in um, from the legend, you can see is either um, protected open space or open space of some sort, or it's a non-residential unit. So it might be commercial use, it might be an industrial use. For this um, analysis, we didn't look at that, but we're hoping to in the future. Um, and as you can see, um, Quincy Center is one of the highest um, stations. I think it was the second highest in your region with eight units per acre. Um, another station, Wollaston, again, serving the, the city of Quincy, over 3,000 total units and 6.4 units per acre. So that's, that's coming a little bit closer to that five units per acre um, goal that might be appropriate for the South Shore region. Um, another great example, one I'm very familiar with, my friend lives uh, about a five minute walk away from this station, is the Weymouth Landing East Braintree Station. Um, on the Greenbush line serving both Braintree and Weymouth, about 1,800 units and 4.3 units per acre as the average density. So this is just right about in that middle um, that if, um, you know, if we adjusted for around five units per acre and stations went around this, this is what the situation could be. Um, Braintree Station um, serving Braintree, 1,200 units, 2.6 units per acre. Um, and as we can see here, um, it's not that the Braintree Station isn't busy. There's obviously a lot of commercial and industrial, which you all know better than me, but there looks like there could be some additional opportunities for density. Um, West Hingham, um, this is an, an example as we start to go into more suburban communities, you can start to see the, the residential parcels um, Right here, each of these is a residential parcel. They've gotten larger. Um, and as you can see, according to the legend, you know, we've gotten less dense. So where we were looking at Wollaston, they were much smaller parcels with um, denser parcels. Now we're seeing larger parcels with less units on them. And again, more um, protected water or open space. Greenbush is another example, um, serving situate. 292 units um, with 0.88 units per acre. 
Um, my understanding is that the town of Situate has been really proactive in thinking about zoning moving into the future. So this is an example of, this is a snapshot in time and maybe in a few years, uh, this station area could look really different. And that would be, uh, I'd be happy to come back and we could revisit those in a few years. And then this is the least dense station you have on the South Shore, it's the Kingston station. And I'd love to hear more from people, maybe in the Q&A about, um, you know, what, what is it actually like to walk around this station? Do people walk around this station or are you just driving and parking and getting on the train? Or were you doing that, right? So um, 55 total units and 0.1 units per acre. Um, my understanding is that this station area was a proposed 40R development. I don't know if that moved forward, but again, what could this look like if that 40R overlay zoning came in? Are there opportunities here? I'd love to hear more about that from everyone in the Q&A. And with that, I just wanna put the information for the website, mhp.net backslash todex, um, my name and contact information, as well as if you would like to follow us on Twitter where we, I think every single week, we highlight a different station um, in the system and talk about what's going on there and get comments from people, um, please do. And with that, I think I will hand it back to Janice and we will start to go into questions. Thank you. Great, great presentation, Callie. Every time I see your presentation, I learn something more. So thank you for that. Um, we do have some questions in the chat box, so I'm gonna get right to it. Um, so somebody, Katie Lacey, asked, um, are these just unit acre numbers for the 0 .5, 0 0.5 mile radius around the station? Um, I think she's asking whether or not it's a half a mile around the radius of the station is really what your calculation is. Yeah, I'll take that one. Yes, that's correct. And Katie Lacey is one of my colleagues. So thank you for uh, giving me a softball, Katie. I appreciate it. Yes, um, we created the station areas, again, as the crow flies, half a mile buffer around the station areas. Um, for some of them, they end up being the area is less than half a mile because there are so many stations close to each other. Um, but for the South Shore, I, I don't believe there was much overlap with any station. And just so everyone knows, at, at Mass Inc., whenever we're doing our um, calculations of the TOD areas, and I focus primarily in the gateway cities, but when we're doing our calculations, we also use that half mile radius. Uh, but right now we're working on a research project where we're combining some information about walkability and bikeability uh, to get a more accurate understanding of what the uh, study area around each rail station and each transit uh, hub should be. Uh, to kind of be very much more reflective of some of those issues that Callie brought up in her presentation about, you know, protected green space, waterways, um, things that uh, are going to be very difficult to even think about in the development process. Okay, this is coming from an anonymous attendee. How do we get buy-in from our local governments, Boston, ZBA, et cetera, who are elected and directed by the NIMBYs <laughs> who think any type of non-McMansion development will turn their town into an urban area. Yeah, yep. Kelly, do you want to go first? You want me to go first? <laughs> uh, why don't you go first and I'll jump in. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so I, I remember seeing these questions as you were giving your presentation and, and you know, this is something we're having to uh, deal with all the time. Um, you know, the, the phenomenon of uh, uh, NIMBYism um, and, and I know that uh, uh, Gil Penalosa, who is a noted urbanist, uh, he, he, he mentions uh, uh, CAVE people, which stands for Citizens Against Virtually Everything. And sometimes you have communities where you have uh, a lot of uh, CAVE people who just are just not at all interested in having some conversations around um, doing any type of development, especially not housing. Uh, but the qu real question, though, becomes kind of wh where, where are the objections? And I've heard that in the South Shore, a lot of those objections uh, stem around uh, uh, concerns around increases in traffic. And so and this is the reason why we talk about uh, transit-oriented development, is that whenever you think about doing housing development, making sure that there's additional development so that people don't have to get into their cars in order to get to the things that they need and use each and every day. As someone who lives in Boston in a neighborhood 
um, with everything except a movie theater within walking distance. When I lived in Seattle, I actually had a movie theater within like four blocks of my house. This, this community, I don't have a movie theater, but I have four grocery stores within walking distance of my home, five pharmacies. I mean, it's just everything is right here. And so it, it kind of really does kind of help ease those concerns. I think another thing is to keep in mind that whenever we say density, the first thing people think about is bulk, giant hulking buildings that are gonna block sunlight. And so uh, to not equate density with bulk, I think is probably a good next step. Um, you know, I, 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 there are communities and cities here in the United States that do this well, but I actually think some of the best examples come from my time in Germany, where it's actually still kind of common practice where you never build any building higher than the church steeple in the town. And so, you know, as a result, uh, that kind of, I mean, even in Berlin, you know, you can stand, you know, anywhere in the middle of a city of a million plus people and see all the church steeples. Um, and so there are very few areas where you have high rises. And so I think that, you know, kind of thinking about density as there are different ways to do density without doing, you know, your standard, you know, high rise building. Um, I think that we also should be asking uh, developers and architects, I, as a former architect, I agree with this, to be more creative in how they come up with solutions to increase density without increasing bulk. I think the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, thinking about who is speaking up in support of housing. I think that's why it's so fantastic that the South Shore Chamber for many years, and we at MHP have been thrilled to support the South Shore Chamber um, in their efforts. You know, oftentimes I think um, people get tired of hearing housing advocates or transit advocates advocating for the thing they're supposed to be advocating for. But when it's someone you didn't expect and, um, you know, in years previous, it was the business community. When the business community, especially on the South Shore, started coming out and saying a building housing and thinking about walkable neighborhoods was an economic imperative, I think that really started to shift the narrative. Um, so I would just encourage you, think beyond the usual suspects. Think about who's really impacted by um, building or especially not building. Um, people often think of, well, who can't live here? Um, can I encourage someone who wishes they could live in a community but can't because of the current um, housing situation? Can they come and speak at a public forum and say, I would love to live in this community, but unfortunately because of their situation, I can't. Um, I find that that's been really effective, especially at the, at the hyper local level. Yeah, I, I just want to also add to this um, because one of the central tenets of uh, our recent equity report, now uh, find the link and uh, share it with you in the chat, um, is that a, a key part of the process to kind of stop some of the uh, resistance to development, not just, you know, real estate development, but other development in communities, is to invo involve people in planning their local communities and doing so in a way that is equitable and very inclusive. Like, like Callie said, you know, not just having the usual suspects at the table, but being very deliberate about getting people who usually don't speak up and speak out engaged in the planning process. And so, and that involves really um, uh, a, a lot of facilitating, a lot of conversations to really understand what people want and need. And also for local governments to um, kind of get out of the way and I think that that's hard uh, whenever, you know, um, uh, people are, are, are very vested in maintaining power and control uh, where they have it. Um, but I think that um, communities can work together, not just advocates, but communities can work together to say, hey, we want a hand in shaping what the future of our community looks like. And we're tired of, you know, these five or six people um, totally holding up this process for everyone else. So, um, but you know, that does take a lot of conversation, a lot of work of being more civically engaged, which is something that I think that we've just gotten away from as a culture. So Dr. Corley, on those same lines, um, this is a good question. I think you answered it, but I think they're looking for maybe just a little more specifics on um, what are the best ways to involve the public supporting TOD? And um, how, how do you really reach the underrepresented community members? Yeah, so uh, actually we're uh, conducting some research right now, once again, in our gateway cities um, in partnership uh, with UMass Amherst and Walk Boston. And one of those ways is that we're actually getting uh, people from all across the community, all walks of life, participating in walk audits where we're asking them, you know, in this region, you know, in the TOD area, just walk around and tell us what you're seeing, you know, send us your photos and your videos. What do you like? What do you hate? What do you wish you could change? What do you wish there was more of? 
and uh, it was part of a, a facilitated process of where we have you know a preliminary conversation um, and then send people out to walk and then we have a follow-up conversation and so far it has been fabulous we're having people you know who are you know you know decision makers in you know the local communities we have people who have been homeless from the local communities we have people you know crossing uh, racial ethnic uh, socioeconomic cultural lines um, there are even uh, talk of how you know I think that you know as someone who's lived in Germany and I speak German I speak fluent German but just because you're the fluent doesn't mean you can speak uh, and completely comprehend and understand even what a native uh, person especially the dialogue di dialects and so you know how do you kind of make sure that people have an opportunity to participate you know in their native languages um, and so I think that um, uh, there are uh, many ways to kind of engage people in different ways uh, and, and that's one example. I also highly recommend looking at a Todd talk that we did around joint local planning is, is being produced in a partnership with GBH and um, uh, the head of the uh, sustainability uh, team, Leah Bamberger, who actually uh, I think grew up here in Massachusetts. Um, she, instead of thinking about, you know, doing planning, she said, we just need to address racial equity and justice and so they created a racial equity and justice council and it was the racial equity and justice council who suggested doing a sustainability plan and so sometimes if you like talk so lead the conversation with something other than kind of we, this is the product we want to create and think more about the process of how you bring people together together and get them talking they'll decide what they need to create in order to address uh, some of the hurdles you need to overcome because i think that sometimes uh, when it comes to engaging people um, sometimes you just need to get out and ask them what they want. So I'm going to ask a question if I could on my own, um, just following up on that, um, that point. So if, if a community, let's say the town of Hingham, decides that they're going to have a location where TOD makes a lot of sense and a developer wants to come in and actually develop the site, and then you come into an equity inclusion um, issue or somebody wants to address it. Is that then on the, on the developer that needs to resolve that issue or would it be more in the community? This is where I see a lot of um, butting of heads in the industry doing that. I was just curious. Are you referring to equity and inclusion in terms of maybe affordability or? Well, pretty much all of it. So basically, if you identify a location where you think that um, development would be beneficial to a community and um, what, whatever that housing unit would be. But then when you get, I'm going back kind of to the NIMBY um, issue and the importance for really getting out there and talking to the community about addressing different issues. Is that on the developer? Like if the developer is interested in that parcel of land or do you do that pre-development? Maybe that's how I should say it. Is that pre-development and that's done at the community first? That's it. Oh, sorry. I'll go first, idea. Tracy, and then yeah. please improve upon my answer. No, 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 no. Um, I think that's a great reframing, Janice, of how you asked it. I think that, um, at our organization, our community assistance team has seen a lot of success the earlier you start in the process and really focus on what are your values as a community. I think a lot of communities have um, doubled down on their focus on equity and inclusion. Um, and I think that we in the housing world are thrilled um, that people are focused on that, that are, they're having conversations oftentimes outside of the context of a specific development because I think you're right. Sometimes if you wait until there's a specific development and perhaps people have already gotten their backs up about it, it's really hard to have that longer range conversation about what kind of community you wanna be. Um, so we really encourage people, start having the conversation now, right? I mean, you, you all have seen some of this data today. You know what your communities look like. You know what these station areas look like. You've seen some of the examples that Dr. Corley has laid out as potential places for growth, start having the conversation today about what kind of community you want to be. And then when a developer comes in, you have your values laid out, then you can work within that framework as opposed to, um, you know, 
uh, I'm not so sure about this and I'm, I'm feeling unsure. If you kind of have everything already ready to go, it makes everyone's life easier. And I think the community will be happier with the product at the end of the day. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, um, I, I want to kind of emphasize that whenever you start talking about um, equity, um, linear processes don't work. So there are a lot of things that have to happen in tandem. Now, you know, I talked a little earlier about doing transportation, housing, and um, uh, economic development in tandem, that developing those in tandem, but you also need to talk to your stakeholders in tandem. And whenever possible, get them in the room together. I really want to applaud uh, CHAPA for some of its work that it's doing around its municipal engagement initiative. I'm participating in some of those conversations, uh, and, and there are a couple of cities that are working on uh, housing production plans. And as a result, th there are you know community leaders, uh, everyday citizens, police officers, developers, city staffers, uh, labor union organizers. They're all sitting down working on the plan together. And so anything you can do to get more people at the table, like Kelly said earlier in the process is best. Um, but uh, I think that um, keep in mind that even though it definitely is a slower process for development, it is definitely a much more um, sustainable and longer lasting development whenever you have uh, people kind of working together as opposed to just one person kind of leading the conversation. I think that one of the things that we're seeing in the planning world overall is that master planning um, um, it's, it's definitely needed um, to have experts. You know, I know I have a PhD, but you know, and there are other people who have other PhDs. And it's great to have the PhDs in the room kind of talking, um, but we have absolutely no clue on a good, you know, at least half of what's going on, especially in local communities. And so whenever there, there's an opportunity to kind of step aside and let local people talk about what it is that they want, um, local knowledge should complement expert knowledge in the whole process. So the more experts and local people you can bring together, the better. Okay. If I could also just make a quick plug, Janice, for the work that the community assistance team at my organization does too. They've worked really closely with the Municipal Engagement Initiative at CHAPA. And again, we're happy to share resources and connect anyone with after this. Um, but um, feel free to contact me if you're interested. If you're starting this process and you don't even know where to start, um, our organization provides um, free, free assistance to, to start to figure out where do you go from here, who do you connect with, um, and we've uh, led a lot of people to work with the Municipal Engagement Initiative, which I agree is a fantastic program in terms of building local will for affordable housing. Brittany, you tell me when um, we run out of time. We do have quite a sure. few comments still um, or questions yeah. in the chat. Um, from Katie, one argument that suburban communities make against multifamily is based on potentially negative fiscal impacts. Is there data available about the cost implications? Um, I, it just switched on me. Oops. Where did that go? <laughs> So this is cost implications to the community. Sorry guys, I lost that Here, one. Here, I got it. Um, one argument that suburban communities make against multifamily is based on potentially negative fiscal impacts. Is there data available about the cost implications of single family versus multifamily? And then I, I might just read another comment in here. It says fiscal impact studies of multifamily housing are used to keep families with keep out families with children. There are serious fair housing issues involved. Town should be discouraged from requesting or requiring fiscal impacts analysis as part of the permitting process for mixed income housing. So just a couple things there. Thoughts? Um. I, I can uh, add, but I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I know um, Jessica Tronstein uh, has actually uh, uh, done some research, very detailed research on this in her book, uh, Segregation by Design. I'll put the name in, in the chat. Um, uh, but yes, there has been some extensive research on kind of what happens uh, when you have uh, uh, kind of deliberate efforts to um, separate communities. And she has some very specific numbers on the economic and social impacts of and lots of data in that book 
about um, uh, the impacts that that has had on communities in, in the history, pretty much in the past hundred year history of development in the US. Yeah, and from MHP's perspective, we have done some analysis on this. Right now it's kind of out of date, so I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but happy to share. Um, we have looked at municipal impacts, and I believe the headline from that, again, apologies, this was several years ago, is that um, overall it's net neutral, right? There are absolutely some um, impact, there can be impacts on communities, and then there are some places where it doesn't bear out. So I think the um, um, specter of uh, a multifamily development is coming into my community and all of a sudden my taxes are gonna be going up. Um, that could be a reality in some cases, but overall we, don't, we haven't found that to be um, a legitimate argument in many places. And I think whoever asked the, the follow-up comment about um, as a way to maybe keep school children out or um, you know keep any other types of people out um, that's what we've kind of seen right that that oftentimes there might be impacts but sometimes and looking at the numbers can be really useful um, but um, it's that's not um, a reason not to build multifamily housing okay here's another one um, how would um you handled the infrastructure needed to develop 10 units per acre or eight units per acre. Um, in South Shore, the septic systems um, are the highest issues to deal with. A lot of the South Shore doesn't have town sewer systems. Um, so I'm not an infrastructure expert, and my understanding is that you all have a working group coming up that's actually looking at this specific issue. So I might shoot that back to the South Shore Chamber and say, stay tuned. I think that um, lack of infrastructure is a legitimate issue that should be taken into account. Um, that said, I know that um, in the past, um, some communities have purposefully not um, included infrastructure in order to avoid building housing. Um, I can't say if that's the case on the South Shore. I just know what has happened in the Commonwealth in the past. So that is a legitimate limitation, um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what the South Shore Chamber is able to learn about this. And I'm looking forward to that webinar coming up. And oh, I can, sorry, I can just say just a couple quick points about that, or Peter, if you want to chime in, but um, we are um, undergoing a study of a handful of South Shore communities along with MAP MAPC is kind of um, is leading the study with us and we're doing some analysis of the water and wastewater capacity in a handful of our municipalities to try and identify some solutions to some of those challenges about capacity um, and, and more regional solutions, um, more collaborative solutions um, across communities. So it's about halfway through the, the process and um, you know, we'll, we'll have more to come on that uh, in, in you know, early 2021. Um, I don't know if Peter, you wanna jump in and say anything further about that, but um, we know that it's a real, a real issue and we acknowledge that and um, we know that it's you know, part of our plan and responsibility to think about um, some potential solutions for those challenges. Yeah, I, I just uh, reiterate uh, what Tracy said that uh, you do a lot of things in tandem and I think uh, what we're going to find through some of our work on housing and infrastructure is it actually is smarter to start thinking about land use planning generally. And uh, if you're in a town that is looking to do some redevelopment or encourage commercial development, they're gonna need the infrastructure for that. And they may find that housing is a great way to uh, pay for some of that infrastructure um, or to uh, help pave the way for the kind of capacity they, they want. So, uh, what we're hoping to do in this sort of next phase of housing that we're doing is instead of just promoting site by site or project by project, look at where it makes sense for development. 
uh, for location, for mixed uses, for TOD thinking, uh, and then see how we can get the roadways and the water and wastewater systems in place. Do I have time to add to that or are we out of time? Okay. You're the, so you're the time. Speaker. You can say anything you want. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, I just wanted to add that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, uh, when it comes to um, uh, infrastructure, I'm actually teaching a couple of uh, components around social infrastructure. I, by the way, I do a lot of reading. Uh, that's just part of my job. And so I'll share the, the book with you from um, Eric Kleinenberg about social infrastructure. Um, but uh, infrastructure can serve multiple purposes. So instead of thinking about putting in a wastewater system or uh, uh, or or, uh, um, or uh, a sewer overflow system, think about how um, like a bioswale can also serve as a public pool or how uh, a heating and cooling system. When I was at Clemson University many, many decades ago, you know, the heating and cooling system for the library was also a reflecting pond. Uh, and so, I, so, I mean, things can have multiple purposes and uses, uh, but also consider pursuing some neighborhood level um, uh, infrastructure as opposed to thinking citywide. Uh, because, uh, I, you know, I used to do a lot of clean tech uh, development work in Washington State, and I've seen a lot of really cool technologies, like BioJet Fuel has been with us since 1998. Why we're not using it is all a matter of policy. So there are a lot of really cool technologies to do neighborhood level electricity develop a, a generation to create a neighborhood level wastewater systems to actually turn uh, garbage and wastewater back into usable productive products. Uh, so I think that, you know, by using some uh, newer innovations that are actually less costly and actually more efficient, um, I think that those are some just to kind of get your creative uh, juices going. So I'm just going to put that out there and it's, there's, there's a lot of digging that can be done there. And some other things that it's a little out of the norm, but a lot of um, states are now doing value capture um, opportunities. They're doing that. They just started to do that a little bit in Massachusetts, um, around Assembly Square, around the New Balance Station facility. So there's ways to garner some funds through the development. You can also, um, the towns and cities can set up um, district um, improvement zones um, where they would, depending on what they would build, they could get um, monies based on the sale to pay for the infrastructure improvements without getting too technical. Um, but that's basically the gist of it. So a lot of communities are doing that and it's very successful. Somerville um, really was above um, the curve on that one and I commend them for their their whole policy there. And Courtney, we should uh, recognize on that uh, water wastewater regarding uh, the partners on that. That's being led by MAPC and it comes from a grant uh, yeah. from Mass Development uh, with a, a grant from our own Economic Development Corporation. Yes. Okay. Yep. So we have um, a couple more here. How do you see mixed use playing a role in increasing housing density on the South Shore? I can take a first stab at that. Um, so, sorry, the question was, mixed use playing a role in increasing housing density on the South Shore? Well, I think what I've heard um, from the South Shore Chamber has been a real focus on um, not just having the South Shore be a bedroom community to Boston, um, but especially in this these COVID times, right, where maybe we're traveling less, you want everything that you need um, closer. Um, it shouldn't make sense to go into Boston um, or tr travel somewhere else for what you need. So I think thinking about mixed use can be a really great way to um, bring vibrancy um, to maybe um, some of your existing downtowns that um, maybe need a little help. Um, I can think of one specific example I've heard of in the past um, here on the South Shore, um, thinking about, you know, just increasing foot traffic. Um, again, as I think people don't go to malls anymore, or if they do, um, you know, malls are changing, right? So um, thinking about what kind of that a traditional Main Street 
Um, the South Shore has a lot of great existing infrastructure for that. I know there are a lot of wonderful communities where you can walk up and down the streets and it, you know, um, I, I bother my husband with this, but we walk up and down and they say, it'd be so nice if there was an apartment there, right? It'd be so nice if you could live above that and then um, walk to the library, walk to something. So I think it's a way to get away, you know, as um, Dr. Corley mentioned, get away from um, what maybe have been just large swaths of dense um, housing to thinking more about integrating housing into your community um, as opposed to having housing there and all your um, services in someplace else. But, so that's how I really think about mixed use being a benefit here on the South Shore in terms of housing diversity and affordability as well. Yeah, and I also want to add to that um, this uh, whole edge city phenomenon as well as these kind of like uh, housing development enclaves. Um, uh, one of the things I find very frustrating is when Greenfields, uh, this really great open space is totally grazed. And uh, you put in place uh, these hulking new developments that have all the amenities you need right there in your own building, but they don't connect in any way to the rest of the community. And so you're kind of living in your little bubble. You've destroyed an area that could be, you know, like really great uh, space uh, for people to use for all. And meanwhile, some of the downtowns have vacant storefronts and uh, your existing industrial parks and malls and other commercial centers are, are, are crumbling because everyone wants, wants to have the shiny new thing in their own building. Stay away from that at all costs. It might look cool today and it might attract investment today, but five years from now, um, you're gonna have a completely decimated um, downtown in your town in your city um, with you know these very vibrant places where shuttles like they're doing today are taking residents from you know your local community into these faraway places like going to like uh, Haymarket in downtown Boston there's no reason why any development that happens shouldn't be connected to keeping people active and engaged in your own local communities great response um, we have one more here. Um, how do we improve on offering more affordable housing in the area? The development in Quincy Center and Quincy Adams are newer and more expensive units for development. And this seems to add to the concerns of equ equity issues. I can take a first stab at that. Um, so one thing that um, if anyone goes to our Data Town website after this, which I just put a link to, is you can look at every single community in the South Shore and see where they land on their subsidized housing inventory or SHI, which is how much of their year-round affordable housing is designated as affordable. Um, I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with this. Um, so the specific question about Quincy, um, as I know Quincy has been doing a fantastic job um, in is committed to building affordable housing in their community. What I, my first thing would be take a look at surrounding communities and where are they on their subsidized housing inventory. Um, I think um, the only way that we're really going to be able to build more housing and make sure it's affordable, not just capital A affordable, but lowercase affordable, um, is if all the surrounding communities are also committed to not only, again, capital A and affordable housing, but thinking about housing diversity. Um, I think another thing that we should be thinking about is um, zoning reform. So I would love to hear from people about um, when's the last time you updated your zoning codes in your community? Um, I think what we've seen in the past is that um, if you take a look back at zoning from the 50s, it's actually gotten regressive since then. So um, we did a, a report several years back called Illegal Communities, which is actually, if you're a planner, um, sorry, it's pre-existing non-conforming uses, um, and said, what couldn't we build here today? And I'm sure that there are a lot of communities here on the South Shore neighborhoods. I bet Wollaston might be an example, actually, um, that you walk around and you say, this is so great. I love how walkable it is. I love that I can get to things. I love I can hop on the train. Could we build this today? In Quincy, that might be the case. I wonder if that's the case for other South Shore communities. So that, that's where I would start. Think about um, zoning reform across the entire region. Um, 
And that might be one way to help you think about increasing affordability again on, here on the South Shore. I'm gonna piggyback on that um, first. Uh, well, well, yeah, totally agree with the lowercase a or what I call naturally affordable housing. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna push back on the whole zoning reform thing um, and recommend if you're doing joint local planning, if you're engaging the local community in the planning process, you should not need zoning. So I would say instead of zoning reform, do a zoning phase out. How can we as a community get to a point where we have a land use roadmap so that we're actually making sure that we're not poisoning people, we're not killing people. And at the same time, you know, involve local communities as well as other communities in our planning process so that we can look at an area within our region and decide what's needed here because every single community is going to be different. Kind of looking at some of those TODEX uh, maps or some areas that had a lot of housing, but I always wondered, you know, okay, you know, there's great density for housing there, but how many jobs are there? How many retail locations are there? How many places of worship are there? That's one of the things that we're looking at at MassLink just in our, our Gateway City TOD areas. Uh, but every community is going to look so very different and it should be a community by community basis of what kind of land uses do we need here to make this a vibrant, active community for our region. And so zoning, once you start kicking around the lint with, you know, how tall the building is, um, then, you, you know, you're, you know, you're in a bad spot and we've been kicking the lint around for nearly a century. And so I think it's time for us to kind of get away from that and start thinking a little bit more broadly. And then also answering the question, affordable for whom? So I think that uh, the way in which affordable housing subsidization uh, calculations are made, uh, I look at the numbers and it makes me um, kind of both mad and makes me laugh to look at if you have, I think it's 25% of a building is affordable, then all of those units count as affordable. And it's like, wh what does that even mean? So that it's very difficult to get a true count of exactly how many affordable housing units there are in a particular community or region. And so as a result, you know, affordable is as 80% AMI and then you have some extremely affordable units. But if you think about it, you know, in an average community, if, you know, your median household income is $100,000 and $80,000 is, um, uh, is the threshold for affordability, but you have a large swath of people who are making the national average, which is 55, 54, where do housing prices really need to be? Where do rental prices really need to be? And then do we have any public housing available to help people kind of fill the gaps between where the markets are? And then the other thing that kind of comes up for me is looking at other ways to actually construct housing. I think that there is a revolution that's happening in other places around the world as to, uh, to help get construction costs down by making it more of a manufacturing process, which I know as someone who is very, um, craftsmanship is very near and dear to my heart. I spent a lot of time with craftspeople in Germany uh, on, on construction sites and I have I've been on construction sites. I've done construction work before. I know what it's like. I really enjoy it. But I think that it's just too costly. We really need to get to a point where we're having things that are a little bit more standardized, a little bit more modularized, and then that, so that people can bring it to site and then customize it and maybe even set up local, uh, like small scale non-toxic manufacturing facilities to provide more jobs locally that way. Um, but I think that we need to kind of rethink exactly how we're building housing in order to get the cost of it down. Interesting. Well, um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in here. We're bumping right up against our, our time at 3.15. So um, I just wanna thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Corley. Thank you, Callie. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Nancy. We're very fortunate to have you all um, here today to share your expertise and to have um, you involved in our work. Um, very grateful to you, very grateful again to our housing initiative funders for their support of this work. Um, I will be following up with the link to the event if anyone wants to watch it again. <laughs> and happy also to share um, Callie and Dr. Corley's contact information should anyone want to reach out and um, you know ask them some additional questions. I know we got to most of the questions, but if you had a question that didn't get answered, Feel free to shoot it over to me and I'm happy to send that along to, um, to the um, team here.
and uh, please feel free to reach out to us if we can do anything to help support you or if you want to get involved in our work in any way um, we're, we're um, an open line so please we hope to hear from you all soon and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week thank you again for joining us thank you everyone thank, thank you, you.